Today I'm joined by Iziad Abdel Noor, who is the president and CEO of Blackhawk Partners. Welcome to the show today. Thank you, Scott. Glad to be here. So, Ziad, you grew up in Lebanon in the 1960s, and I wonder what was that like? And specifically, was there a fondest memory of growing up in Lebanon? Well, in the 60s in Lebanon, and even in the 70s, early 70s, because the Civil War started on April 13, 1975, from the 60s to the mid-70s, it was heaven on earth. It was the Switzerland of the Middle East. It was the Paris of the Middle East, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, free flow, banking, freedom, real business, all the, uh, the petrodollars ended up in Lebanon, banking secrecy. Uh, absolutely amazing. It was, those 15 years were absolutely amazing. Uh, this is how also you got uh, the growth of the Lebanese entrepreneurial spirit. You know, Lebanon, you know, we're talking about the Phoenicians here. We invented trade 6,000 years ago, built the Temple of King Solomon, where the biggest worldwide traders in the world. Uh, this is pretty much reflected in the Lebanese spirit, entrepreneurial spirit. I think it's in our genes. I'm not trying to exaggerate or anything. It's true. Ask anyone. Look at today in the Gulf, all the advisors of the biggest, wealthiest families and groups are run by Lebanese. Go to Africa. It's all controlled by Lebanese. Nigeria, Ghana. Go to Brazil. You have 6 million Leban of Lebanese descent. The former president of Brazil was Lebanese. In the States, you have 2 million people of Lebanese descent. We are one of the few countries in the world where the people in the diaspora are, uh, it's more than the people in Lebanon. You have four, people, four million people in Lebanon, you have 16 million people in the diaspora. Uh, I, think, uh, I think there are very few countries, uh, maybe the Greeks uh, and maybe the Jewish diaspora where you have the, the same proportion. 95% of them are Christians. 95% of them left because of economic circumstances over the years. Beirut was invaded 13 times in its history. Uh, and it always, you know, uh, came back. The resilience of the Lebanese, the entrepreneurship is absolutely amazing. And I'm not saying this because of I'm of Lebanese descent. I'm not. Uh, seriously, because I met a lot of them. I know all of them in the diaspora, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I've been dealing with a lot of them over the years. And there is good, bad, and ugly, yes. Uh, they can be as good as you can, and they can be as ugly as you can. Uh, I'm not just talking in terms of, I'm talking about, you know, even in business. So that's pretty much, uh, you know, I learned a lot. Uh, I'm very proud of being a uh, Lebanese descent. My, uh, my, uh, my home is the United States. My uh, origin is in Lebanon. I'm proud of saying it. Um, and Lebanon is, uh, is really, you cannot really, also a lot of people, they don't have a clue what they're talking about. Lebanon is not an Arab country. They always lump the Arab world into one thing. Like they say, you are Arab. It's like you're saying you're European. The Italians are Italians. The French are French. The Greeks are Greeks. You can't say I'm European. The same thing with the Arabs. The Saudis are different than the Kuwaitis, different than the Lebanese, different than the Palestinian. People who know, who've been in the area, know that. The others, they're total morons who have no clue what they're talking about. That's pretty much it. Uh, I can attest to the fact that uh, having met quite a few uh, Lebanese entrepreneurs throughout uh, the GCC, media region, as well as in Europe and the States, is exactly the kind of DNA fabric that you explained. Very entrepreneurial, very progressive, very open-minded, and uh, very much of, uh, I would say, risk but also balanced perspective on things. The other thing that I kind of took away from my interactions with uh, Lebanese entrepreneurs is that they really 
grasp it to the whole in the sense that they don't know, uh, to your point, what's going to happen. So they learn to appreciate and to celebrate. And I, and I was an incredible spirit that I saw. You know, absolutely. I'd like to add to this fun. They're survivors. Okay. They're relentless survivors. They don't know what's going to happen. And they adjust. You see, the thing between the Lebanese and others, like even the Greeks or even anybody else there, the Lebanese, or even the Arabs, actually, the Lebanese adapt. They adapt to where, whatever environment they are. The Lebanese in Brazil are more Brazilian than the Brazilians. In Africa, they're more African than the African. In the United States also, they're real patriots. Pro-Americans, very much American. It's not that they, you know, uh, other cultures, they still have their little club, little society, little thing, not the Lebanese. They are seeking money, power, success, and they know the, 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 uh, the goal is to melt, is to melt with society, is to understand how the U.S. system works, how the Brazilian system works, how the Greek system, African system, and this is why they succeed, and this is why they excel. A lot of them, I mean, you know, I, I, I know a friend, just I don't want to elaborate on that. I know a friend who has my family name, who became a senator. He changed his last name from Abdelnor to Abnor, James Abnor, A-B-D-N-O-R. He doesn't care. He wants the Senate seat. He changes his name to get there. Nobody thought this guy was Lebanese, for example. Some of that adaptability, I think, to me, is also about creativity and ingenuity, which we'll get to in a later part of this conversation. But I want to talk about, uh, again, a little bit about your background. You have a, a typical background from kind of the most Lebanese in the sense that your father was a wealthy businessman, a former prime minister. Your uncle was a major banker and also MP as well. So I wonder, growing up in that era, but also having a certain step up, so to speak, how did that grant you access to the world and some of the elites? You may also like our quarterly Astro Perkins event that brings some of the most notable experts and category leading startups in their area of sustainability and human survival on Earth and in space. To register, visit astroperkins.com forward slash events. Well, I grew up a very privileged, I have to admit. I went to a European boarding school, it's very private, very successful, where a lot of billionaires went. So I really, uh, you know, interacted with billionaires very early in my life. So they don't impress me. Nobody impresses me. No president, no king, no prince, no billionaires, because I grew up with these people. I know their fears, I know what they think, and this was a huge advantage. Maybe I didn't learn a lot at these boarding schools, but the contacts I made were priceless, and I got to know how these people think, how the wealthy, the powerful, the people who make the news think, and how they act. So yes, I was born there, uh, and uh, but you know the problem, it's uh, anything you do, you think it's a uh, double-edged sword. Uh, my father, my parents being like this, they were at the same time, very strong personality and very authoritarian. Uh, so either I have to abide by that, uh, by their rules all the time, or else I chose the else. I, I'm not, I don't follow authority. I, I don't follow establishment. It's in me. I'm a rebel. I'm a maverick. I'm a troublemaker. I like to change the order of things. Not like this is how it is, take it or leave it. No, no, no. There is no take it or leave it. I make the rules. I change the rules. I break the rules. I've always been like this. From the day I married my wife, we eloped because my father were not against, where, where my family were against it. I was too young. To the day uh, I went to, uh, I started my career on Wall Street. You know, I got there, very difficult to get there in the mid 80s. You know, with a name like mine, 
You know, at that time, it was the domain of the wasps and of the Jews. So who the fuck are you to come in here and disturb the, uh, the, the, the balance? I did disturb the balance. I did not uh, rock the boat. I sank the boat and created no one. Uh, you know, you have to have this passion. Today, everybody is like trying to comply, trying to, oh, you don't want to rock the boat because some, your friends are going to be upset. Who gives a rat's ass about my friends being upset or not? Or changing the order of things? I like that. I mean, this is what it is. This is how you make money. You make money in chaos. You make money when you change the order of things. You make money when you're in control. You know, all these titles of these guys at big corporations, they are VPs and senior VPs and managing directors. It's all crap. They're titles. They're glorified clerks. They are in charge. They're not in control. If you're not in control on your life, you're in very control, you're going nowhere. You can be in charge in the rest of life, life till you get your pension and that's it. This stuff is not taught in schools in colleges, and that's very sad. So clearly, I think there is a, there's a, a narrative or a, a pattern that's emerging, but I want to go back and, and talk a little bit about your career in Wall Street, because that's a very interesting time period. Because to your point, I'm sure at that time when you joined, there weren't a lot of people specifically from Lebanon, let alone the broader area. Now, Wall Street back in, let's say, the 80s, it was kind of that hard charging and at times, frankly, it was unethical and it was all about profiting and enriching themselves at any cost. And it, since then, of course, over the decades, we've seen some regulation and compliance oversight that's at least softened some of that aspects, but certainly the, the edges are still there. But during the heydays of Wall Street in the 1980s, where you have movies coming out like The Wolf of Wall Street, for example, you yourself, uh, you were at Dressel. Burham Lambert under the fame Michael Milken. I wonder how your time in Michael has taught you to be what you call a killer. You know, it's not what he taught me, what they taught me. It's what they did. They were killers. They were people who wanted to revolutionize the whole thing, the whole system, and they did. They revolutionized the financial landscape. If you're a small company and you want to access money and buy a company that's 10 times bigger than yours, you can't do that. The system, the order tells you you cannot do that. We at Drexel created financial instruments, junk bonds, high yield bonds, whatever you want to call them, to basically borrow big amounts of money based on cash flow, not on assets, and acquire any company you want if you can execute. We changed the name of the game. We changed the rules. And this is what makes us, we've made us very successful. Look, I mean, uh, you know, being, uh, making money, et cetera, there's nothing wrong in that. Today, it's like you're, you're viewed as a villain, as a capitalist, as a privilege. You cannot do that. It's not nice. Well, life is not fair. Get used to it. I'm privileged. I make money. I like to make, to help people make money. At the end of the day, make no mistake about it. Money is about freedom. It's not about acquiring things, showing off things, etc. It's the freedom to do whatever the fuck you want, whenever you want. As long as what you're doing legally, I never broke the, broke the law, uh, and I will not do anything at any cost. And that was the, the problem with Brexit, is that we were doing things at any cost. I learned from that. Never again to do things at any cost. No. There are limits, but however, you know, doing things legally, but very creatively, very different, by thinking different, there's nothing wrong in that. If I beat all the competition, there's nothing wrong with that. John D. Rockefeller used to say, I don't need competition, I crush it. Well, I say the same thing today. It's not a friendly environment. You cannot say this. You cannot be viewed as a capitalist villain. Well, I will crush every competition. No matter what, that's my, this is how I work. This is not a friendly, we have to all be friends. I'm not there to make friends. I'm there to make money for my shareholders, for my partners, for myself, to create value, to build real companies, to finance empires. That's my goal. Whether some people got pissed or not, I don't give a rat's ass. 
if you want to make an omelette, you're going to have to break some eggs. Unfortunately, today is the age of diminished expectations. Well, you cannot think like this. You cannot talk like this. You're going to offend people. Get offended. Like I give a rat's ass if you're offended or not. I'm not hurting you. What am I doing to hurt you? If you're a wussy who don't understand how to take care of yourself and who needs the government to take care of you, that's your problem. I'm not going to lower my standards to fit your standards. What I'm telling you, you idiot, is to up your standard to my standard. I will tell you how. I will show you how I've done it time and time again. I to define what a killer is. And I wonder, being that killer, that killer instinct or killer drive or killer execution, at some point, do you keep bumping against the moral compass? And at what point does it start to blur or get compromised? And do you even know, <laughs> does any, anyone even know that at some point they become too callous to even know that they've hard to see what's wrong and what's right? Uh, no, my, my, my moral compass is right. I'm not doing, I'm not stealing from people. I'm not cheating people. I'm not lying. I'm not doing anything. This business should be like this. By going, my competition, by going and buying out this competition, buying out the people, there's nothing unethical. If people think it's unethical, I'm paying them their value. Maybe the company where they are, they don't understand or appreciate their value. It's all about value. You make money by creating value. That's what I'm doing. So, you know, you, you can't, you can't. And who are these people to tell you what you should do? I mean, really, like I go to like some Harvard Business School idiot because he has white hair. He makes maybe $400,000 a year or you should do this and that. And who the hell are you? You don't have skin in the game. You never built a business. You pontificate. I have no respect for you. Who the hell are you? Why should I listen to you? Because you're at Harvard Business School, this piece of crap liberal college. So what? It has produced a lot of idiots. All the Ivy Leagues. I'm an Ivy League guy. I'm a Wharton grad. But it's, I don't carry it on my shoulder. I'm a Wharton grad. I'm a Wharton grad. Like, if you go to a Harvard guy or, Wharton, or guys like this, you're, you're in a social environment. Every five seconds, they drop the word that they went from Harvard or Wharton or Stanford. Who gives a rat's ass? So I'm going to respect you more if you tell me this? You see, people are so stupid. They live by, it's, it's all sound bites. How you work how you comb your hair, what kind of tie you have, you handsome or not, what's the color? It's all style. No more substance. I look at people's substance. This is how the killer, the killer has substance. The style, there's a zillion of them out there roaming the world, dropping names. I know like they tell me people want to do big trades with me. Oh, I know King X or Prince Y or the Saudi royal family. Like if I give a rat's ass, about the Saudi royal family, about Mr. President, about this and that. I don't, I, I don't get impressed with that. I went to, a, to private school and boarding school. I met all these people. Nobody impresses me. They don't. What impresses me is the character and the substance of somebody, not where he went to college, what he's saying, how he looks. Yeah, I think one of the things that I, I personally find that very distasteful is the worship of men. The cult of the personality. Exactly. Let's talk about a couple of your successful books, the most recent being Startup Saboteurs, How Incompetence, Ego, and Small Thinking Prevent True Wealth Creation. If you could tell us a little bit more about your book. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, it's all about wealth creation. Everything we do is about wealth creation. When people tell me, you, you're involved in so many things, what do you actually do? You cannot put me in a box. Oh, I'm just a venture capitalist or a trader or an investor. I'm a wealth creator. How do I make money out of thin air? That's the key. Very few people think like that. They put themselves in a box. They are a trader working for this company. So they lose their jobs. That's all what they know what to do is trading or investing, or lending, or this. Nobody gives a rat's ass about you, about your career, about your future, and definitely not the government, any government. So you have to take care of yourself. 
how ego encompasses a small thinking prevent wealth creation exactly. 99% of the deeds fail because of ego. Because the guy thinks he's too smart, too important. I tell them literally, have a nice day, no interest. I don't have to do business with people with such attitude. I've reached a point where I can do business with, I choose who I want to do business with. People with attitude like this, uh, I really like to shock them. And sometimes, believe it or not, humiliate them in public. I love it. I'm not worried about it. Oh, you know, we shouldn't do this. We should, who are you to tell me you shouldn't do this? Who are you, Mr. X, who makes $100,000 a year to tell me you should do this? What have you learned? Nothing. Why? Because the social environment tells you that you should do this? Ego. Incompetence? Tons of incompetent people. Tons. They think they know stuff. They know nothing. Especially these young guys who graduate from Harvard, Stanford, they think they are God's gift to earth. They're 25-year-old assholes. They've never run any business. They've never managed any money because daddy put them in that college. They think they're so smart, so important. They have ego and incompetence because they've never run anything. So that's a double whammy. These guys are literally destroy them in public. The smart ones appreciate it. Send them me, thank you so much. I want you to be my mentor. Like, you know, the story of Dick Cheney, when he was hunting, he shot somebody in the face. He came back thanking him for shooting him in the face. You know, I humiliate them. And they come back. And, 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 the, and, the, and the weak ones, the incompetent ones, they become even more arrogant. So I destroy them even more. Look, listen, this is war. Business is war. This is not being nice to each other and getting together. It's getting things done. Whether people, they're getting things done by whatever way. It's war. It's not a, 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 a walk in the park business. So, so I wonder, you know, for those that are reading your book and, you know, how so can, how, how book, can two words, put Two words. The book will tell you how you build a business, scale a business, exit a business, negotiate a deal, everything in a very smart way to win. The how is certainly laid out in the book, but I wonder for the average Joe who doesn't have money, who doesn't have prestige, or perhaps doesn't have the network or access or influence, can they really make it happen? Yes, um, yes. By the reason the reason I ask is because yeah. the how prescriptive doesn't necessarily mean that everyone that reads or absorbs that information have a certain level of intellect or intrinsic motivation or grit or abilities or even willing to compromise. Okay, okay. Don't forget to visit astroperkins.com to register for our next quarterly events. Past and current speakers include Damian Vaughn, former NFL player, Neil Gregory, Chief Thought Leadership Officer at the IFC World Bank, and many more. To register, visit astroperkins.com and click on events. Okay, okay, let, let me tell you, okay, you don't have to have, to make, to have money to make money. When I came to this, I told you I left this privileged environment to come to the States because I refused to be under my, 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 my father's shadow and we alone. When I came to the States, I didn't have any money. I had nothing. From being driven in, a, in, a, in super luxury cars to going taking the subway. Huge, you know, realization of that. I lost all the privileges I had. And my father didn't talk to me for three years until my first kid was born. And I had to struggle. And I learned that. And, I, and this is where I learned a lot about how to apply these skills to create wealth. I didn't have any money uh, until late in the days at Drexel Burnham. But I started really uh, making money. You don't have to have money. You have to be smart about it. A lot of people are self-made billionaires. They didn't have any money. They didn't come from wealth. Only 3% of the people in the United States who have wealth got, uh, was inherited wealth. The rest, they made it. So for the average Joe, if he doesn't have an ego, if he's willing to apply the discipline, 
is really, is, if he's willing to differentiate the wheat from the chaff, he can really make a lot of money. And my book is the Bible of that. Absolutely. There's not one ounce of bullshit in the book. I'm not here with Tony Robbins, etc. Talk about, you know, I want to make you feel good. No, I want to make you feel good. All this digital marketing stuff. I don't here to make you feel good. I'm here to go right in your soul and tell you, this is what you need to do. You may not like what I say. You may hate what I say, but this is what it takes. But I wonder, again, this is a general question about, let's call it the self-help or the seminar or the training industry, is that I think it's there for a reason. And because if somebody had the right formula and it worked consistently, we wouldn't need any other self-help books or materials out there, but yet we continue to need it. And I wonder, having that formula isn't necessarily the true you know, secret to success. In your case, what you know and what you practice, you learned it early on. Yeah. And you've already built the network and so forth that, again, the average Joe doesn't have. So yeah. knowing what to do, but not having the experience or the privilege or the access isn't going to always result. So sure, are we going to have 0.001%? Yeah, but you know, knowing what to do is putting yourself in the right place, the right environment, the right people around you. You know, at the end of the day, you become the average of the five, six closest people to you. You are surrounded with idiots, you're going to be an idiot. If surrounded with self-made billionaires, you're going to be one. Know how to network, know how to learn, know where to pick the people, the companies, etc. So people tell me, oh, Ziad, what do you think? You know, I want to start a job with this company. What do you think of this company? I don't look at companies. The company is made of people. I look at people. I tell them, who do you want to work with? Who is the guy who's going to be your boss? What's his track record? Did you do some work, some, some, some research on that guy? No. So you want to go, go and spend your life working with people you know nothing about because he works for a prestigious company and he's nothing but a clerk, glorified clerk at this company, and he can be fired anytime. That's stupidity. People don't look at it like this. That's I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. It, it's interesting because you know, there was an article a few years back before Macron became president of France. And it talked about this one event that was held and who actually attended his event. And these are exactly the kind of people that you're referring to. And he chose to surround himself with people that were 20, 30, sometimes 40 or senior that were truly makers, people that really essentially shaped the world and of not just politics, but industry. Yeah. Um, so you, are, you are who you are in terms of the average means. So it's a great point. You do make a point on your website that as you age, you realize that it's oftentimes not about having quantity of friends, but having a few handful of few gems of, you know, in terms of real friends. How do you know who your friends are when you're surrounded by advisors and sycophants, frankly? How do you experience, know that? experience mm -hmm. dealing with them, testing them, uh, testing their limits, testing their, their loyalty, testing them all the time. Uh, you have to be very smart about it. Uh, you know, and after doing it year after year, you get to be really good at it. A lot of people look at the surface. They never dig deep. They never dig what's really inside. You have to ask them some very challenging questions. You have to put them off track. You have to push them off to see how they react. Everybody knows you cannot push them off, but will lose my friend. If you're dealing with a billionaire, I cannot piss him off because I'm going to lose him. No, no. Billionaires, when you deal with them, if you piss them off, you're going to get their attention. You're not going to get their attention if you're a doormat, a yes man, yes, your highness, yes, doctor, yes, uh, Mr. X, X, this, or that. All this reverence bullshit. It's bullshit. They teach you. It's weakness. People who have reached such level of power, they need to deal with people with power or with perceived power. You cannot tell, oh, Mr. Bezos, oh, Mr. Zuckerberg, yes, whatever you want. No, Zuckerberg wants to be challenged. Hey, kid, what the fuck do you know about this? He's going to, you're going to get his attention. How does this guy talk to me like this? 
So, so Zia, I think you use a particular technique, and let's call it a BS detector. Are you able to share that uh, with us today? Yeah, very quickly. I'm challenging the people in power, challenging them, because people in power like to be challenged. They don't want doormats and yes man. Everybody telling you, oh, you have to listen to what this guy said, etc. You have to be polite. You have to like all these people who bow. Who the fuck do you want to bow for anybody? Oh, take their their word like if it's uh, gospel. Everybody can err. Everybody. Like some people tell me, oh, you know what? I have this investment deal for you. Uh, Warren Buffett and Goldman Sachs invested in this. But, but they need another $50 million because they lost their shirt. And why the fuck do they invest? Because Goldman Sachs and Warren Buffett invested in this piece of shit. They lost $75 million. You want me to put another $50 million on that? What are you, fucking crazy? Oh, but you know, what? Am I going to go and bow because it's Warren Buffett and, and Goldman Sachs? I mean, there's so much people are so easily duped, manipulated, and conned. Look what happened. Coronavirus, all this shit, the whole world bowing to that. And now boosters and this and that. People like to be led. You will never be successful and make money if you like to be led. You're going to have to take the bull by its horns, let them fuck this order of things I lead, and this is how I lead. You don't just say I lead because you have an ego. No, you have to back it up. Somebody comes in uh, wanting money for his business. You know, when, when I ask a question and he tells me, I don't know, I told him, you're out, you're finished. There's no, I don't know. When you're coming requesting money for your business, you have to consider yourself as God. You know everything. If not, get the fuck out of my face. I don't want to deal with losers, with people who do, oh, let me check my files. Check your files. You have to know your files. By, you have to memorize this stuff. You're the CEO. What a fucking whim. Check your files. So I, I, I think our, our... I want winners. I want killers. I want rebels. I want radical people who want to change the world, who want to change the order of things. Anything short of that bores me to death. And, and, and I abhor weakness because I don't sympathize with them. I humiliate them to see if they're going to wake up and get stronger or collapse. You know, so like I, today, the whole society is that everybody in class is good. Let's give a lollipop to each one of them. I don't want them anybody to feel bad. We're all equal. Let's get lollipops. What a fucking education. Sometimes you have to make somebody feel really bad so that he wakes up and say, fuck you, and shows you how he's going to succeed. Like Steve Jobs. They fired him. The board fired the, the guy who founded the company. He came back with a vengeance, fired them all, built a trillion dollar company. That's power. That's killer. Not like, oh, Steve Jobs, you know, we have to feel it. He feels bad. Fuck this shit. To, to summarize here is that, you know, it's interesting because this show is really about innovation and creativity and, and of course, leadership. And a lot of the guests that we have, I think, in many ways exhibit a lot of these killer instincts or behavior. Perhaps maybe it's not phrased in the way that you phrase it, but I think a lot of the qualities uh, is very much personified. And hence, they are oftentimes category winning companies within their sector or domain. So definitely a very valuable and very refreshing perspective. I phrase it the way I want with all due respect. It's not because of lack of respect, because to make the point, you know, and then I'm an immigrant. I can get away with anything. <laughs> That's the beauty about it. Thank you, Ziad. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And with that, I have been joined by Ziad Abdelnor, who is the president and CEO of Black Hawk Partners. Thank you again. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.